Amen. We are the unstoppable church. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We are in this series. This is week number three. If you haven't seen any of the previous parts, please go online and check those out. But today I am very, very excited about our special guest. Uh, I met John Pudiate. I think I'm pronouncing that closer this time than I did first service. Pudiate. That's right. Pudiety. John Pudiety is the, uh, 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 he leads a ministry here in Colorado Springs called Bibles for the World. And he is a third generation believer and follower of Christ. And you, when you hear where his story began and the legacy of his family, it is just a phenomenal story. When, when I met through a mutual friend and I heard this, I said, please come and share with our church because this is the power of of the gospel, the power of the good news of Jesus Christ, and how it can change and transform lives. So would you give a very warm welcome to my new friend? Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dean. I am just honored to be invited to share here at Rock Family Church this morning. My family and I came to hear the opening message in this series, Unstoppable Church, a couple weeks ago, and I followed online, and I am really humbled and honored that Pastor Dean offered to share his pulpit with me. Rock Family Church, just in case you don't know it, you have got an incredible pastor here. Pastor Dean is a man truly gifted in teaching. The word he makes is so clear and simple and applicable. And on top of that, the way the leadership that Pastor Dean, Pastor Kim provide to this church, to this, to this family. I mean, the other, they just, I mean, praying for other churches here in town. You don't see that. And just even giving financially to help other startups, other church plants. I mean, that's just amazing. That is, you just know God is working through them. I tell you, after listening to a couple of Pastor Dean's sermons, I almost felt like giving him my notes and say, you do it. (laughs) You're going to do it way better than I am. But uh, in this series, Unstoppable Church, we've learned, first, that the church is not a building. It's not even just this one church, but it's the entire body of Christ across this entire planet. And last week, we learned that the most effective way that we can work as a church, as a body of Christ, when we are united, when we work together together, in the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a part of that body of Christ that you may never have heard of. But before I do that, after seeing last week's sermon with all the mannequin parts, got me thinking, how many of you know the name of this part of the body right here, the back of the knee? Uh, doctors and physiotherapists, please don't answer. But is there anybody who knows the, what that's called? Back of the knee. <laughs> anybody? It's not called the knee pit. <laughs> it's called the, actually has a name, the popliteal fossa. So there you go. You learned something new today. Likewise, there's a part of the body of Christ, a member of your family, that you probably never knew before either. But like you, a part of the global church. And this part, I might add, like the popliteal fossa, has a rather shadowy past. That part of the body is a small tribe from northeast India, my own tribe, my own people, who are known as the Mar tribe. That's spelled H-M-A-R, the Mar tribe. We're from a very remote part of India in the foothills of the Himalayas. And as Pastor Dean has said, this story involves headhunters. The Mar tribe, like those of you here watching online who are followers of Christ, are now part of his body. And I, as a member of the Mar tribe and a follower of Jesus Christ, can firmly say that I stand before you only by the grace of God. As Brad and the worship team, Pastor Brad and the worship team led us, there's nothing that God cannot do. And I I trust that my, my message today, my testimony, will bear witness to that. You see, my my tribe wasn't always part of the body. Back when the British ruled over India, my people had a rather bad reputation. We were known as one of the fiercest headhunting tribes in all of the British Empire. 
My tribe originated somewhere in China. It's been suggested that we might have been one of the people groups enslaved to build the Great Wall of China. And at some point, I guess, they decided, hey, you know, we don't like being slaves anymore. We don't like this gig, you know. It's uh, hard work lifting those heavy stones every day. It's long hours and bad pay. And we decided we'd rather fend for ourselves against the tigers and bears and pythons and other wild animals in the jungle. So we became what anthropologists called a semi-nomadic people group. And we migrated down from China into Burma and eventually into what is now India, always in search of better hunting grounds and better land to farm. Along the way, there were disputes with other tribes and other people groups, usually over land and territory, and my people would often go to war against these other tribes. The only weapons that they had were bows and arrows and spears, and of course, these machetes. And they would go into battle, and my forefathers would chop off the heads of their enemies. And they would bring those heads back to the village to prove their bravery. Talk about a people group that needed training in conflict resolution. <laughs> But the warriors would bring those heads back. They would celebrate their victory. They would get drunk on, on rice wine, and they would dance around those heads that they had taken in the battle. Those heads would be dried, and then they would be hung on the walls outside the door of the warrior's hut. So anyone who would walk by would know, there's the hut of a very brave man. This headhunting tradition was even woven into our animistic tribal religion, as we believed that those whose heads that we had chopped off would become our servants in the afterlife. Interestingly, our people had a belief in an afterlife and even in a single supreme being. So my tribe migrated down over the centuries from China through Burma and into India and finally finding a place to settle there. And our People also practiced what's known as a slash and burn style of cultivation. We would clear the deep jungles, remove all the good timber, uh, bamboo, and firewood, and then after it all dried, we would set it afire in the remaining brush. And that would become where we would plant our crops, our rice and vegetables and other crops for that year. Each year, the village would sell, select a new area of land for cultivation. And so over about a 12 to 15 year cycle, we would work our way around our territory. Now during this time, the British were advancing across India into the Northeast region, and they had discovered tea, and they were bringing the seeds down from China, and they had begun planting tea in this Northeast region known as Assam. Are there any tea drinkers here? No, oh, quite a few. You might have heard of Assam tea. It's not as aromatic or flavorful as uh, Darjeeling, but it's a good solid deep red tea, and that's, that's the tea that comes from our region. So, so the British are expanding eastward with their tea plantations, and eventually they reach our area, and they began to encroach on our traditional farmland. They probably didn't realize that it belonged to us because we were farming the other side of the mountain that year. So it might have looked like just no man's land. But my forefathers didn't take this encroachment of their land uh, very well. They didn't appreciate this. And so in 1871, they gathered the warriors of the tribe and sent them down to the Alexandrapur Tea Garden. And in one night, they chopped off the heads of over 500 of the tea garden workers and they kidnapped the tea garden manager, Lord Winchester's daughter. Well, the, the British didn't take this attack lightly, and they sent in hundreds of soldiers on horseback to first rescue the girl and also to punish us severely. So now here are my people. They would left China, left the slavery of China, and they had come down into India, and now they were under the British rule, and they're getting beaten and and... Just, you, you know, I'm sure they're wondering, why did we do this? Why did we come down here? 
But you know, news of that headhunting raid and this savage tribe of headhunters traveled back to the homeland, back to England, back to the United Kingdom. And that's where it reached the ears of a young man from Wales. His name was Watkin Roberts. And Watkin Roberts had become a follower of Christ during the Great Welsh Revival of 1904 to 1905. He was only in his late teens then. He had started his training to be a pharmacist. In those days, they called them a compounder because they would, uh, with a mortar and pestle, they would uh, grind up the ingredients to make the medicines. So Roberts heard the story of this headhunting tribe And along with it, he also heard the call of God to bring the gospel to us. So Roberts connected with a missionary doctor who was also going to that area. And in 1908, at the ripe old age of 22, Roberts set sail for India. They set up their work, their ministry, in the the easternmost outpost of the British, which was a fort called Izal. And soon after they established their work there, the Gospel of John was translated into one of the languages. It was the Lusai or Mizo language, which is a neighboring language to my own Mar language. So Watkin Roberts bought copies of this newly printed Gospel of John, and he sent them out by mail to the chiefs of each of the villages in our tribe, in our region. And one of those copies of the Gospel of John reached my grandfather's village. When the chief of the village received it, he called the village elders together. They couldn't read it. They didn't know what it meant, but they knew it was something important. And so they had one of the semi-literate members of the village scrawl on the back of the Gospel. Please, sir, come and explain the meaning of this book. And they sent that Gospel of John back through the mail runner. In those days, everything was on foot. So the mail runner took it back. And when missionary Roberts received that book back and read that message, he knew that was his Macedonian call. Just like the Apostle Paul had received that vision of a man from Macedonia saying, please come help us. Likewise, here it was a request from a headhunting tribe. Come share the gospel with us. Missionary Roberts tried to get permission to visit my grandfather's village, but his requests were denied by the British authorities. The British colonel told him, this is just an invitation to get your head chopped off. But Roberts had heard the call of God, so he snuck out of the British fort and made his way through the jungles, traveling over a week on foot, and finally reach our village. He was only able to stay in the village for five days, but during that short visit, the Holy Spirit spoke through him, and he was able to share the gospel message with our people. Roberts had evidently done his homework, because he knew that when our tribe would be at war with another tribe, taking each other's heads, but when they wanted to make peace, the drums would sound out a call to call a meeting of the two warring tribes or villages. And the two warring chiefs with their respective village elders and warriors would come down to the boundary line between these two tribes and they would negotiate the terms of the peace. And if a peace agreement was reached, a large animal, usually a bull or a buffalo, would be killed right there on that boundary line. And as the blood would flow across that boundary line, peace would be declared. The two reconciled chiefs and their warriors would then share in a great feast of that animal before returning home to their respective villages to bring the news of peace. So by using this analogy from our own culture, missionary Roberts shared that we as man are at war with God. There is a divide between man and God. But God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to be the boundary line sacrifice. And through him, by his blood, 
we can be reunited with our Heavenly Father for eternity. From that short visit of Missionary Roberts, five young men gave their hearts and lives to Christ. And my grandfather was just a young man of 14 or 15 years old, still a headhunter in training, perhaps. He was one of those first Christians. And then the missionary left the village saying, he's going to come back. He's going to teach us more about this man, Jesus. But when he reached back to the British Ford, he was severely reprimanded for going to such a dangerous area without permission and also without protection. So he was kicked out of the district and then later kicked out of the state for trying to maintain contact with our people. And eventually he was banished from India altogether. Now you might think that the story would end there, you know, just five young men became followers of Christ. But you know, the seed of God's word had been planted among my people. And those first Christians began to share the good news of Jesus Christ with whomever would listen to them. They would go from hut to hut, from village to village, and they shared the message of the love of God and salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. My grandfather and some of those early Christians, they were even called the gospel intoxicated young men. And by World War II, when the Japanese invaded our area of India in 1944, almost the entire tribe, perhaps 98% of the tribe, had been reached with the gospel by our own people. And there were only two villages at that time that were still holding on to their tribal animistic religion and ways. And shortly after that, after the war, those two remaining villages came over, were reached with the gospel. And so not only did those first Christians reach their own people with the gospel, but they also reached out to the neighboring tribes, from one tribe to the next tribe and then to the next. And that work continues to this day. And what is most amazing is I've researched this. I spent a lot of time over in India working in the ministry there and found out that it wasn't until 1938 that my grandfather and those early Christians even had the whole New Testament, let alone the Bible, and again, in that neighboring language. So most of this evangelism was happening with just the Gospel of John. We say just the Gospel of John, but we know the power of God's Word. But the, and that was in another language. My people, the Mar tribe, previously one of the most feared tribes in the British Empire, for their headhunting ways. They had been completely transformed by the power of God's word. They had been transformed from headhunters to heart hunters for Jesus Christ. My, my grandfather was an itinerant preacher and evangelist. He walked over those mountains those hills, sharing the gospel. And, but he also knew that his people, our people, needed to have God's word in our own language. <clears throat> so my grandparents, in their own simple way, they dedicated my father, who was just 10 years old, to get the education needed to translate the Bible into our Mar language. Of course, they had no idea what that meant, you know, the amount of education it would require, the study of Hebrew and Greek and, and all of that, but they just, in simple blind faith, they said, we need to have God's word in our language. And so we are committing our second son to do that task. So this commitment led dad on a journey out of the, our jungle hills to the nearest school, which was 96 miles away. And dad would walk on foot at the beginning of the school year, five days to reach school. And then he would stay there through the school year and walk back five days uh, back to wherever my grandfather was preaching at the time. And, you know, I mean, talk about a legacy or a heritage to, <laughs> it's like, you don't want to walk to school a mile and a half? I walk 96 miles. <laughs> Uphill both ways. <laughs> While in college, uh, this, this journey and this commitment took dad further on to high school and college in other parts of India. 
And while in college, he met a man that some of you might have heard of, Dr. Bob Pierce. He was with Youth for Christ at the time, but he went on to found two organizations that I think most of us know. It's World Vision and Samaritan's Purse. So this started a lifelong friendship and helped Dad to go on from his studies to Scotland to Glasgow Bible Institute. And it was while in Glasgow in 1954 that another man I'm sure you've heard of, a guy by the name of Billy Graham, came to Scotland for the All Scotland Crusade. And so over the course of that three month crusade, dad was volunteering, helping in promotion, publicity, counseling, setting up chairs, whatever, any helping in any way he could. And so I guess that he caught Dr. Graham's eye because just before they were to return to the States, Billy called him up to his hotel room to meet with him and his wife, Ruth. And Billy asked dad, well, I was kinda, I've seen you around here during the crusade. Where are you from and what are you doing here in Scotland? And dad just told him simply, I'm here studying God's word so I can translate it into the language of my people. Billy looked at dad and said, well, we gotta get you to Wheaton, referring to Wheaton College in Illinois from which Dr. Graham had graduated. And with one quick phone call, dad was admitted to Wheaton College to study at the Graduate School of Theology. Dad only told me in his later years that he never told Dr. Graham that before coming to Scotland, he had applied to Wheaton and had been rejected. (laughs) Amazing. While there at Wheaton, Dad completed the translation of the New Testament into the Mar language, and about 10 years later, he completed the translation of the entire Bible. You can imagine the joy on my grandfather's face as he held that first translation of God's word into the Mar language. Now, his people, our people, would know that God speaks our language. A couple of weeks ago, as Pastor Dean began this series, I was so blessed, especially when he shared the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Goes on in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The other version we're quite familiar with from Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. I share these with you because a couple of years ago, I was so pained to, to hear the report done by the evangelical Barna Research Group that surveyed American churchgoers. These are people who go to church two or th- at least two or three times a month and found that a full 51% of them did not know the Great Commission and that only 37% of them could even identify the Great Commission from among a selection of verses. Well, here it is on the screen again, and I ask that each one of you read it, memorize it, Hide it deep down in your heart, knowing that it is your call to action. For my grandfather and those early Christians of the Mar tribe, it was found in the Gospel of John that they had first received. It reads like this, John 20, 21. Peace be to you, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. As the Father had sent missionary Robert, so send I you. Those were the marching orders from my grandfather and those early Christians of my tribe to move out with the love of God, with the message of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. The church, the body of Christ that grew out of my grandfather's heart-hunting ministry is now over 315 churches spread across 10 states of India. This indigenous church, with most of its members still having household incomes of less than $150 to $200, they support over 200 missionaries across India in almost every state of India, as well as missionaries in neighboring countries of Burma and Nepal and Bhutan. The Mar Church has even sent missionaries to all the way to Cambodia, and Japan. I mean, talk about taking the Great Commission seriously. The Great Commission was also the marching orders for my father and mother as they founded the work that is now Bibles for the World and that I am now honored to lead. 
over the last 50 years since dad completed his translation work, we've been blessed to provide millions of copies of God's word in over 120 countries around the world. We've also continued to support the work in India, of course, equipping and encouraging the evangelism and church planting. And through an internationally accredited seminary, we've trained future pastors and missionaries. Now we have them coming from about 28 different people groups, most of them reached by our own people, just reaching the next tribe and the next tribe and the next tribe. We also support over 40 Christian schools providing a biblically-based education to thousands of children each year, as well as a hospital and other compassionate ministries in the name of Jesus. After my father completed the translation of the Bible into our language, he realized that our people need to learn how to read. And so he and mom started uh, schools in a lot of the villages. Dad, Mom and dad wanted them to be able to read God's word for themselves. And so now our people have a literacy rate of over 95%, the highest in all of India. And this is all a byproduct because of the power of the gospel. Yes. We also put together missions trips to visit these areas, so we welcome you, invite you in the future to join us where we're working, where we're distributing scripture in Africa, India, Nepal, Bhutan, China, and if it's the Lord's will, later this year we hope to go to Vietnam. These are ways that we're continuing to carry out our marching orders, the Great Commission. And thinking back, all of this ministry started with a single copy of the Gospel of John that came to my grandfather's village a little over a hundred years ago. It also started because of the obedience of that 22-year-old young man to be obedient to the Lord's call on his life to reach that headhunting tribe that he read about. This is what can happen. This is what God can do when my grandfather and those first Christians, when the body of Christ is obedient to the Great Commission, even our, our, our Lord's last words to the disciples before his ascension into heaven echo the Great Commission one last time. From Acts 1.8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses you, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. Now you may be thinking, wait, I don't know if I'm called to the ends of the earth, the uttermost part of the earth, as it says in one translation. But let's look at this verse one more time. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Colorado Springs, in the Front Range, Colorado State, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what it's saying to us today. We are called wherever we are, in our town, in our district, in our state, and it's not a one or the other. It's all of these, all of the above. We are all sinners, everyone on this planet Earth. Maybe even some on other planets, right, Pastor Dean? <laughs> I saw that. And while I doubt that any of you were headhunters like my forefathers, we've certainly all done bad things in our life. We've all sinned. Yet we are all offered by God the same salvation through Jesus Christ. And if we've we accept the free gift of salvation and follow him. We are now part of his family, part of his body, of, the body of Christ, part of his unstoppable church. Yes. But you know, with that membership also comes responsibilities to follow his commandments, especially the great commandment, and to follow his orders, especially the great commission, go into all the world and make disciples. We're commanded to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. To be his witnesses in Colorado Springs, and across the Front Range, and all over Colorado, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The transforming love, power of God's love, 
of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit compels us, compels each one of us. Not just former member, members of a former headhunting tribe, but each one of us here this morning, and those of you watching online, to reach out with that same love, to share that same message of salvation, to pass on the Holy Spirit's power to those around us in Colorado Springs, in El Paso County, in Colorado, across the USA, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Especially in this crazy time of COVID, we try to, as we try to carry out his commandments and his, his commission, we must follow the direction and claim the promises found in his word, especially the one found in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we know that if we're operating with a spirit of fear, it has not come from God. And if it hasn't come from God, there's only one other place it could come from. It's come from the enemy. So my prayer for, for you as you go out of here today is that, that the Lord will remove all fear from you. And that he will replace that fear with his mind. He'll replace it with his discipline. He'll replace that fear with his power. And he'll replace that fear with his love as you share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. With his power and with his love and with his good news, you, my fellow members of the body of Christ, you are unstoppable. May God bless and empower each one of you with his word. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. We'll let you go in just a minute. But I don't want us to rush past this message we've just heard. Sitting there thinking, John, the pride that your grandfather must have had when your dad announced your name. I've met a lot of Johns that I've known in my life and friendship. I've never met a John that has a legacy of what the gospel of John transformed a society, transformed generations. And so to us as a church, we're challenged in several ways. John's grandfather was vocal, a teenager. We believe in teenagers here. And I believe revival in this nation, it begins with our youth. Begins with our youth. The youth are going to change our nation. And then I see John's father that walked 96 miles so he could become educated, so he could learn the word, read the word, and share the word. And then we wrestle to walk to our den to read the word. We struggle to go to our nightstand to get our Bible, to read the word. This book is the answer the world is looking for. And we are so privileged, and we are so privileged to have this Word of God. I want to become one of those that is known as gospel intoxicated. And the power of what Jesus can do and the message of the cross that can transform lives, can transform your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, because I dare say that any of you have friends that are, have taken heads off. I don't know that any of you are buddies with mass murderers. But look at the power of the gospel. I look at Watkin Roberts, a 22-year-old that said, you know what? I'm going to obey God. And I'm going to travel halfway around the world to go to a tribe and to a people group that is scary and intimidating but he followed God and what you have to know is if God is leading you 
to share Christ, to witness to that coworker, that friend, that neighbor, he has already established it. God was already working on John's grandfather's heart. The young man was already saying, there has to be more. There has to be more than taking off another man's head. And when he heard the good news of Jesus Christ, the seed, the ground had already been prepared, and Watkins just needed to bring the seed. And you have to know this. If God is leading you to somebody in your circle of influence, he's already prepared the soil. You just need to bring the seed. And watch what God can do. Will you stand to your feet with me? Father, I pray for us that you would grant unto your servants all boldness, that we would boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We would boldly declare the love of a, of a loving God and the love of our Heavenly Father. And the Lord, that we would not shy back, we would not be reserved, we would not be timid, but Lord, fill us with your boldness. Fill us with your grace, your strength, your power. Give us the words to speak when we don't know what to say. And God, we pray for our city. We pray for Colorado Springs. We pray for transformation in this city. We pray that you would use us to bring people to church, to bring people to Christ, and that this city would be transformed and ultimately our state, our nation, and to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we go, I dare say there's anybody in this room that is guilty of cutting off another man's head. And to me, the power of the gospel is if the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ can transform a headhunter, there's hope for you and there's hope for me. And maybe you're here and you've said, I, I, I just, I don't, I've done too much. I've gone too far. I don't think you've cut off a person's head. And if God can do a miracle in that family, what could you be? Could you be the grandfather that starts a legacy of faith, a legacy of living for God, a legacy that spreads the good news and has a global impact because of you saying yes to Jesus, because of you saying, yes, God, I yield to you. I'm going to count to three. And if you're here and you need a new beginning with God, you need a do-over, or you need to start brand new with God, I dare you to take that step of faith and say yes to God today. And I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and just hold it for a moment. And someone will see that hand. They're going to come and pray with you right where you stand. You aren't going to be embarrassed. You're not going to be intimidated because that's the enemy that's trying to lie and deceive to you and say, no, not today. Let's do it another day. Let's not today. Let's go have a little fun. Today is the day of salvation. Your life tomorrow is not guaranteed. And I want to make sure that if your life ends, that you're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in heaven for all of eternity. On the count of three, make that step of faith. Choose to say yes to God today. Be a legacy changer. Here we go. Let's go for it. One, two, three. Shoot that hand up really high. There's one right there. There's one, two, three right there. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Amen. Praise God, church. Yes. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to make sure Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the service. If you live here in Colorado Springs or you're going to be in the city, I hope that you'll come and experience the service firsthand. And for those of you that are enjoying the ministry and you're being fed to on a weekly basis, I invite you to partner with us financially and make an investment into the mission and the vision of Rock Family Church. And lastly, if you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you make that decision today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next weekend? I dare you to pray this prayer with me. Would you close your eyes? Would you pray this prayer with me and repeat it? It goes like this. Pray this with me. Say, dear God, forgive me of all of my sins and mistakes. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I invite him to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. My life is now in your hands. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen.
Hey, thanks for making that commitment. Will you email us at info at rockfamilychurch.com. Tell us about your new decision to stand up big and live strong for Jesus Christ. We'd love to celebrate with you. God bless you guys. We'll see you next weekend.